You may proceed. Thank you, Warren, and beautiful song. And we sang that one quite well. Appreciate that so much. And he's right. Next Sunday, we'll move to a, a little bit more challenging book to uh, discuss as we continue to go one book by one book through the Bible. Tonight, tonight uh, we are at Ecclesiastes. Next week, we will be at Song of Solomon. So uh, let's center our minds tonight on the book of Ecclesiastes. I want to take just a little bit of time to walk through the theme of the book, to tell you some things about the book, and then in just a moment, after looking at a big picture, we'll, we'll zoom in and look, and look at uh, that, that text that we all know so well in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. You know, probably the, the biggest debate of all time, philosophically, is the question, what is the meaning of life? People, ever since the very beginning of time, I'm pretty sure, started asking that question. And we know people today ask that question. But fortunately, God envisioned this. He knew us because He made us. And he wants to help us wrestle with that question, knowing we would eventually ask that question. He gives us some answers, and I believe that is primarily the reason he gives us the book of Ecclesiastes. You know that it is a book that's called the wisdom literature. It's part of the wisdom literature in the Old Testament. And so that in and of itself tells you that it is going to help us. It's going to give us wisdom. And that's one of the words that we'll often see in this book. If we had to be forced to pare down the book of Ecclesiastes in just as few of words as possible, I might just say that this would be a book about Solomon's search. It's about the preacher. Most people believe Solomon is the one who is experimenting uh, and questioning and asking these questions about life. And this, I think, represents a search that Solomon goes on during a part of his life where his, um, his awareness is very acute. He is asking a lot of questions. He is testing his knowledge. He is really wanting to find the answer to this philosophical question, what is really the meaning of life? And I would suggest to you that as it, Solomon struggles to make sense of life, he serves as a great example for us. And you might not realize this, but you probably have more in common with Solomon today than some of the people in those days had in common with Solomon. Remember who he was. He was king, and he was rich, and he was extremely intelligent because we remember how he asked God for that wisdom and God gave him that wisdom. But yet we live in a time when Solomon, if he was a part of our society, would probably fit into a good segment of our society, being very wealthy and being very smart. And we know that we live in a wealthy and we live in a sophisticated society. And just as Solomon asked those questions, people today ask the same questions. What, what really is the meaning? of life. And so the theme of the book of Ecclesiastes, and really the end result of Solomon's search, I think is this. Life apart from God is completely void and meaning of purpose. This is, of course, if you separate life from God. And so I think the real key here to understanding what the book of Ecclesiastes is all about is to understand that it involves God. Life must involve God. And, and so when we try to figure out what life is about apart from God, we're never going to find the answer. It's never going to make sense to us. So the idea is that life apart from God does not make sense. Now, if you've ever read through the book of Ecclesiastes, and you probably have, it's, it's an interesting book to read, you probably have noted the phrase, under the sun. That phrase is mentioned around 28 times. It might depend on the translation you're reading from, but it's mentioned very often, under the sun. And here is a key, I think, to understanding this book. The phrase, under the sun, is best understood to mean apart from God. 
So in other words, when you're reading in the book of Ecclesiastes and you come across a verse that says something about under the sun, if you would really read that with the understanding apart from God, it might open up some new meaning to what this book is all about. Let me give you a couple of examples of that. If you go to chapter 1 and look at verse 3, it says, What does man gain by all of the toil, toil which he toils? Under the sun, but if you read that with the understanding apart from God, it seems to make a lot more sense. And then if you go down to chapter 1, verse 14, where he says, I have seen everything that is done under the sun. So let's read it like this. I've seen everything that is done apart from God, and behold, all is vanity and striving after the wind. So I think the real answer to the question what is the meaning of life is really answered by Solomon as he asserts life apart from God is meaningless. If you're trying to figure out life and you remove God from it, life then will never make sense. You will never find the answers that will satisfy you. But that is, like I said, a, a big picture look at what the book of Ecclesiastes is all about. But what I want to do now is to zoom in a little bit. And so if you have your Bible and you have it open to Ecclesiastes, go to chapter 3. And this is the passage in chapter 3 that I think probably is the most famous in the whole book, maybe outside of the last couple of verses. We know this passage in the book of Ecclesiastes the very best. And so in these eight verses that we often read, and you've heard read so many times, we... Uh, are fascinated with what is being said here. And so I want to take the time to, to read these, and then I want to look at some possible ways to understand these, these uh, verses, and then we'll have some concluding thoughts um, here in just a moment. So let's first of all read Ecclesiastes 3, beginning in verse 1. To everything there is a season and a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck what is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to gain and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. How many times have we heard these verses read in appropriate settings that perhaps address something particular to life at that time? And these verses remind us there is a time. There is a time for everything. So how should we understand these verses in view of life? Well, I've read three different possibilities as to how we should read these verses and understand these verses. Some have said that these verses really explain life's events to be fatalistic, fatalism. And of course, when you look at some of the verses in Ecclesiastes, they really do sound fatalistic. Look, for instance, at chapter 2, verse number 21. For there is a man whose labor is with wisdom, knowledge, and skill. Yet he must leave his heritage to a man who has not labored for it. This is also vanity and a great evil. This is one of the things that people struggle with in life. They work hard all of their life. They amass some amount of money. And then often they leave it to people who don't even appreciate it. And that may sound fatalistic, to some people. And there are other verses we could give as an example, but when you read these statements in view of Solomon's final conclusion that God is what gives meaning to life, then we understand that we do have control, that we have control over what's most important, and that is our eternal fate. We may not have control over what happens in life, but we have control over what's most important, our eternal fate. So some read these verses and say that they are fatalistic. Some say these verses explain how life's events are fitting, 
And I think that is a good way to read these verses. All of us are very familiar with these verses, and we've heard them used, uh, and we've heard um, this kind of explanation offered that what, what the, the writer is saying here, the wisdom here, is that there is a time and a purpose for everything that we read about here. We've heard them read at funerals so many times, there is a time to be born and there is a time to die. Uh, but to be fair, I don't think this is uh, the best way to read these necessarily when you look at the whole book, but it is certainly not an improper way to read these verses and, because th they do fit into one way of, of explaining what these verses say to us. In other words, these events happen. None of us can deny that these events, events do not happen. Uh, they seem to represent some good times that we have in life, but they seem to also represent some, some bad times we have in life. As a matter of fact, Solomon actually teaches the very principle that there is a time and a place for everything, not only here in chapter 3 and verse 1. He also says this about life in verse 11. We'll come back and look at this a little bit later, where he says he has made everything beautiful in its time. I think that's just another way of saying there is a time and place for everything. And then down in chapter 8 and verse 5, it says the wise heart will know the proper time and the just way for there is a time and a way for everything. So this, this is a, a proper way for us to understand these verses that, that they're saying to us that, that life's events are fitting. However, I would offer one additional thought to how we should read these verses and understand them. I think these verses also explain how life's events are frustrating. Because when you read what is being said here, it represents goodness, it represents what's bad, it represents the high points of our life, it represents the low parts of our life. It represents some things that we have control over and some things that we have absolutely no control over. Remember that the entire context of the book of Ecclesiastes is really explaining the frustration that Solomon felt about life as he searched for its meaning. He was looking for meaning, but he was not searching for meaning in the right place. The word vanity, the word that means um, that something is meaningless, is mentioned 37 times in this book. So when you read these words in the context, you can certainly see the despair of the contrast of each of these statements in chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. It's like Solomon is saying, nothing stays done. It's like saying, nothing makes sense. He's saying good things and bad things almost seem to cancel each other out. And you can see why this would be a, a frustrating way to read these verses and to think about how this represents how life really is. Life is such a frustrating thing to make sense of. And there really is no way for any of this to make sense. If you look at verse 9, he even asked a question right after this when he says, what profit has the worker from that in which he labors. And if you go back up to verse 6, remember it says there is a time to g gain and there is a time to lose. It's like he's saying you can work hard all of your life and you can make money and then you may lose it just in the drop of a hat. So you can see the, the frustrating way that Solomon is referring to life, thinking about life. And yet we know that there is more to this book. We know that this book is helping us overcome a frustrating life. And so I want to leave you then, uh, based upon what is said here in chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, I want us to look, uh, beginning here in verse number 10, and, and I want us to see three ways that we should deal with a life of frustration. All of us can agree, just like Solomon would agree, that life, even though these things are fitting, even though these things happen, it causes life to be frustrating. So how do we deal with that frustration? I want to leave you with, with three thoughts. Number one, when life seems frustrating, we should understand that God should be included in all that happens. Maybe another way of saying this is we should even understand that God has a hand in all of these things. God 
God allows for these things to happen. Now, I understand it's hard to make sense of this when you look at how some of these things represent the consequences of sin. Obviously, some of the things that happen in life, they represent the consequences of, of people sinning. And so I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to balance that theological, the theological fact that, that sin occurs and God doesn't want sin to occur and that the devil is present in our world and he causes some of these things as he tempts us and, and we give in to temptation and, and some bad events occur in life that are even mentioned right here. I'm not trying to balance that with the fact that God has a hand in that. This is a separate discussion. But God understands that these events are going to occur. And when life seems frustrating, we need to understand that God should not be forgotten during these times. He needs to be remembered during these times. If we read these verses in the context of the whole book, it's easy to see these contra why these contrasting events are really, in fact, frustrating. But here's the deal. Most people experience life, as we read it here in these eight verses, they experience these things without God. And that is the whole point. They are trying to experience life and trying to get through life and trying to make sense of life. And they're going through these ups and downs, these high moments, these low moments in their life, and, and they're not trying to do it with God. And the, the better idea is to, to recognize when these things occur. Many of these things are beyond our control. Just to recognize that God should be included at all times in our lives, during the good times and during the difficult times. In other words, God's hand is in the events of life. God is in control. These, whether they make sense to us or not, are a part of the way the current world exists. And we then go about being involved in these things. We we have our hand in these things. We are occupied by these things. The, the ESV says in verse 10, I have seen the business that God has given. The New King James says these are the, the God-given tasks with which the sons of men are to be occupied. Another translation says that these are the various kinds of works that God has given to mankind. And so we're going to be involved in these things. These things are going to happen in our lives to some degree or the other. And we need to make sure, even though they make life frustrating, we need to make sure that we're remembering that God should be a part of our life when these things occur. Second thing, when life seems frustrating, we should understand that there is actually value in all that happens. There is value in all that happens. Look at verse 11, chapter 3 of Ecclesiastes, verse 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Now, it seems like he's referring to the things that he's just mentioned here good things perhaps even bad things the preacher the wise man says he has made everything beautiful in its time and he has also put eternity in their, their hearts except that no one can find out the work that god does from beginning to end in solomon's pursuit of understanding he learned that life is really best viewed with the perspective that there is usually something good in every situation. You know, wouldn't life make a lot more sense? Wouldn't you have a better um, state of mental health if instead of always looking for the bad and always giving everything that happens in life the worst possible interpretation, if you would look at life and everything that happens in life as, as a way of this could in some way benefit me i can learn from this I, I could even be blessed from this sometimes when bad things happen to us in the end when we look back we can even see how we can be blessed from those things now i, I know that it may seem to go to go against human logic that there is good even beauty in bad things things like death and killing and weeping and mourning and hate and war but we've got to remember that making sense of life with human logic is the problem that's the problem that solomon was struggling with and he had to learn that 
You need to always look for, the God, for God in all of these things as well. And to remember that God can accomplish good even when bad things occur. And we know for a fact that this is taught in the New Testament. One of our favorite verses in the book of Romans is Romans 8 and verse 28. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to His purpose. Remember that Paul said this in view of the sufferings of this present time. Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. And, and he said that in view of what he said in verse 22, how the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains and, of childbirth until now. Because of what happened with sin entering into this world, not only does it affect us, it affects the world. And we look around and nothing seems to make sense. And you've got all these problems that people are dealing with in life. And, and yet, Paul says some good can come from that. That's the way we need to look at it. Those who love God need to look at it in that way, that, that, that God can turn those bad things into good things if we trust in Him and we have faith in Him. Now, when you go back over then to Ecclesiastes 3 and verse 11, you can really see how this plays out. Even when things in life don't make sense, one value exists in all that happens. We can be impressed with the fact that this world is not our home. So it says that He has put eternity in our hearts. That's one way of looking at this. When we are going through difficult times in life, it's just a reminder, this is not our permanent situation. We have eternity, and God's put eternity into our hearts. And the difference in believers and non-believers is how the attitude we have about these things and how they occur and how we feel the, the absence of understanding it's been said that God made everybody with a God-sized hole in their heart. And so when you're frustrated with life, what you're filling that hole with is going to make all the difference. When you fill that hole with God and you trust that what He says matters, what eventually will unfold is in His hand, you're filling that absence, that, that lack of understanding with God. It doesn't mean that you understand how God works. And, and that's what he's talking about in the latter part of verse 11. He says, no man can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. You might not ever understand why it happens that way, but if you have allowed God to feel that absence, and you, you understand the important principle that there is value, God can take anything that happens, and he can make it, good and valuable and a learning experience from you then that seems to soften the blow when these bad things do in fact happen and then one final thing thirdly when when life seems frustrating we need to acknowledge that what we don't understand should just simply be left to the hand of god when we don't understand what's going on in this world we need to have the faith to leave it with God. To, as somebody says, to let go and let God. I think that's what he's talking about in verses 12 through 15, where he says, I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of his, all of his labor. It is the gift of God. I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it, nothing taken away from it. God does it that men should fear before him. That which is already, that, that which is has already been, and that which is to be has already been. And God requires an account of what is past. I, I think these verses are just reminding us to enjoy the good things in life, just like in Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 8, there, there are good things there to enjoy those things. To, to recognize that much of this life can be enjoyed, but also to understand and to acknowledge that when we don't understand the meaning of life, we need to always trust in God. We must always leave it in God's hands. I, I think this is exactly what Job had to discover. Remember, this is the same genre of, of biblical material, the wisdom literature. And, and this is what Job had to Discover. He had to discover that his suffering, in his suffering, in his great loss, he had to learn to trust God. Uh, he had to understand that 
that you can't figure these things out. You'll never understand what happens and why it happens and, and how God operates in life. You just have to trust that God's in control. I, I think that's what verses 14 and 15 are really all about, that God has control and He directs this world and there is some kind of harmony, there's some kind of connection between events past and present and future and, and all of that is in the hand of God, and we just have to learn to leave it with Him, to leave it in God's hand. I want to remind you as we close our lesson tonight, as we're going to stand to sing a song here in just a moment, that the theme of this book is life is meaningless without God. I want you to think about how life never will make sense unless we include God in it. That, if you can't remember anything else about Ecclesiastes, remember, that's what Solomon learned. Did, did you notice there at the end of verse number 15, it says, God requires an account of what is past. I think that's a, a good reminder for all of us that we need to include God in our lives. And when we include God in our lives, then the account that we have to give to Him will be a pleasant thing. It won't be a, a scary thing. And then as this book ends... The, the author of this book says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God, keep His commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Life is meaningless without God. Don't forget God. Include Him in your plans. And obviously, to be theologically correct, make sure that your plan and your inclusion of God in your life is giving your life to Jesus because He is your Savior. And if we can help you realize that tonight, obey Him, put Him on in baptism, or ask for prayer for, for, strength, for, for strength, or if you're having problems with weakness, we want to give you this opportunity right now as we stand and as we sing. Without Him I could